The Unshackled Waves, episode 198. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. The ABC's Four Corners program aired an episode on Monday night hyping up a big new powerful gun lobby in Australia led by the Shooting Industry Foundation of Australia who are trying to influence Australian federal and state elections. Gun control advocates view Australia's laws as the gold standard but still want to go even further. The Four Corners reporter Sean Nichols portrayed Australian gun owners and sporting shooters as wanting to lobby for their rights as a sinister development which will lead to US style mass shootings. But what is the truth about Australian gun politics and the facts behind gun ownership and public safety. Today my guest is Graham Park from the Shooters Union of Australia who was featured in the Four Corners episode on Monday to respond to what was put to air and to explain uh, what his and other shooting groups goals are in upcoming elections and what changes they are seeking in our laws. Graham, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Now, there's a wide variety of uh, shooting groups in Australia. There's obviously yours, uh, Shooters Union of Australia. There's the Sporting Shooters Association of Australia. There's the Combined Firearms Council uh, of Victoria and also uh, Firearm Owners uh, United. Now, mentioning all those groups, it would sound scary to a leftist that there's, oh, there's, there's so many of these groups. But can you start by explaining the goals of your group and how it's uh, different to all the others that I mentioned? Well, all the groups ha have their strengths, like Combined Firearms uh, Council of Victoria is focused on Victorian issues alone and do, do a, uh, an excellent job there. And they're a compilation of a number of, uh, of groups who just then are able to focus locally. Um, Shooters Union itself, Shooters Union Australia, and then Shooters Union in different states, we take the approach we're not a sporting group as such. We're an advocacy group that focuses on representing the interests of any legitimate firearms owner. Now, they may be a target shooter, they may be a collector, they may be a farmer, they may be a police officer, a security guard, anyone that has a legitimate use and, and reason to be owning or using firearms, we want to support and advocate for, um, for them so they get a fair go. And obviously, the, the the main group that was mentioned in the the Four Corners episode, Shooting Industry Foundation of Australia, and as the same name suggests, that's an industry uh, group. Uh, they're, they're a group that was formed uh, two or three years ago uh, in response to the extremist anti-gun people keeping wanting even more restrictions on firearms ownership in Australia. The five largest importers got together and formed an industry group to communicate with government at different levels. And the reason they did that is, like I say, it was a bit of a response to the anti-gun groups and also to governments closing down um, consultative committees, which had been in place for years and simply not communicating. So they said, we've got to do something. They take a different approach from us. We're a user advocacy group. They're an industry advocacy group. I think they're, they're doing a very good job for, for their area. Now, with all these uh, different groups, uh, with, as you said, uh, your different uh, goals and representing different types of people in the, the shooting community, how is uh, recreational shooting and uh, using firearms on things such as farms, how are they currently restricted? What are you trying to change? Well, what's happened is 22 years ago when Australia, under the direction of uh, John Howard, uh, pushed onto the states an agreement called the National Firearms Agreement. It set parameters to encourage the states because it couldn't force the states. The Australian Constitution leaves this matter completely up to the states, but it tried to use pressure to get the states to follow certain things about. Uh, issuing firearms licenses and what types of firearms, etc. And what's happened is it was pretty badly written at the time because it was rushed. 
and even John Howard's admitted he rushed it through because if the Australian people had ever realised the entirety of it, they wouldn't have been as uh, eager to go along with it. And then since then, it's just been continually made even worse by different regulatory changes and different policy changes in various states that restrict um, recreational shooters, far farmers, pest controllers, people like that, t really restrict uh, what types of firearms they can use, how they can use them, and have made the licensing procedures longer and longer. It's In some cases, it acts as a de facto ban. They like to say we didn't ban something, but they made it so hard it's an effective ban anyway. And obviously, the well, one of the restrictions on current uh, firearms use is for self-defense. Well, there's a whole lot of uh, items that are prohibited for self-defense. Is that something Shooters Union wants to change as well? What's your position on that? We, we take a very st strong position on it. Um, self-defense is a basic human right, and it's also legal in all jurisdictions to use appropriate force to protect yourself or you know your family and it seems to us ridiculous that whilst i have the legal right to protect myself and my family in my home if i say i would like to get a can of pepper spray to help me with that that is illegal if i would like to uh, get a firearm legally to do that no, they won't give me a license for that. If I, in fact, if I'd like to buy a baseball bat and say I've got it for self-protection, technically it's illegal to have any item for self-protection in Australia, but it's not illegal to actually protect yourself. It's kind of weird. There's a lot of our laws that are, that are strange, which for some reason it's impossible to get uh, politicians to, to change. What's your opinion on the more the contentious uh, firearms uh, issues, such as uh, semi-automatic uh, weapons, which are heavily uh, restricted in Australia? Uh, there's obviously uh, concealed uh, carry as well. That's uh, that's something that's over in the United States, but uh, uh, not al not allowed here. Uh, where do you stand on those? Two separate issues. I'll address the semi-automatic one first, if if that's okay. In 1996 when they changed, when they brought in the NFA, Australia took an approach that the type of firearm makes all the difference. And so they classified different types of firearms into different categories. I would argue that with some exceptions, you know, there's probably, there is some argument for a little more restriction on say handguns uh, because they're more prized by criminals. So maybe you have tighter uh, storage requirements or something, but, the most common, 90% of what was turned in in their so-called buyback, which was really a um, compensated um, confiscation, because you can't buy something back you never owned. That's just, you know, Orwellian type government doublespeak. But if, if you look at it, 90% of what was turned in was 22 rifles and shotguns. These are not military semi-automatics, you know, that, that people are, are using. These are the guns that anyone over probably 45 on watching this grew up where dad used to take it and they used to take it and go shoot rabbits with. And as I said to Sean Nichols on that, when he asked me this question, which they cut out, is that yes, we support them being treated the same as other firearms once you've done your background checks and your safety training, if I'm responsible enough to own a firearm of any type, it really doesn't matter at that point. A 10-shot 22 caliber rifle, which is a low-powered rifle, can be a, thought of as a rabbit gun or a P-rifle was the old term for it. Whether that's semi-automatic or bolt action or lever action, still holds the same number of bullets still has the same power, uh, except one, you can shoot off the 10 shots in five seconds and, and or six seconds, and one takes two seconds. I mean, really, that's, that's a radical difference. And the same with shotguns. You know, they take the same amount of shells, they're the same power. There's nothing mysterious. But the big lie in Australia is that it's the type of mechanism that makes them bad. And I just find it 
totally illogical. And yeah, they should be people able to access them. If people aren't responsible, they shouldn't be able to have any type of firearm, not, you know, one's good and one's bad. Uh, concealed carry is something that, yes, it is huge in the United States. I was just there last week and uh, uh, I was told there's now 13 million people in the United States who have a concealed carry license who are able to carry, which is the highest number in their history. That's way more than ever would have been out in the old Wild West days. And yet their crime rates continue to drop, which is interesting. Um, many countries do allow uh, concealed carry to a limited or less limited degree. The United States and South Africa, Israel, uh, and a few others, even Russia now, are probably the most prolific, uh, where it's the most common. Because it's concealed, people don't really see it. But it's very, very common. I was in South Africa a few weeks ago, and it's extremely common. Uh, we're actually a little uncommon that we don't allow it at all. I wouldn't suggest that something that everyone should do, but I would suggest that there's certain people. Why would we not have off-duty police officers able to carry a firearm? Because I look at an incident in Melbourne where a guy tried to kill a whole lot of people running him over with a van and an off-duty police officer was quite severely injured by that guy's knife when he very bravely, uh, you know, once the van came to a halt, busted into it and grabbed the guy and fought with him. Now, he ended up in hospital and everything else because currently in Australia, even police officers are disarmed when they're off duty. And to me, that's just, what if the guy had had a bomb in there? What if he'd have something else? And if this officer, who was a sergeant experience of, had, had had his firearm that apparently he's, it's okay that he carries it all day, but the moment he goes off duty, oh my goodness, he may be a risk. So limited uh, things, I, I think it's, it's just common sense that there's some people that should be. Uh, the reason that I've had you on today is because you were featured on the, the recent Four Corners episode titled The, uh, the, the Big Guns, and now... I know how these programs operate there. They interview you for, for hours and probably put together just a small fraction. Are you able to describe first your experience with the, the program? Yeah, you're right. You've had a lot of experience in the media and you're exactly right. They actually visited our farm and were there for a whole day, I think eight or nine hours. The interview process itself was probably two, two and a half hours for that. 90 odd seconds, if that, that you see on the on the show. And I know some of the other people who were interviewed and they had very similar uh, experiences, you know, several hours of interviewing, just as you as you said. And then they've, and, and, you know, they're trying to make a show. They've cherry picked the pieces they wanted from that, um, which isn't always representative of, of, you know, the message or the answers we're, we're trying to give. Now, the agenda from the reporter, uh, Sean Nichols, were, was clear. He was meant to portray you and the, the other spokespeople as part of a, a sinister uh, influence in, a, in Australian uh, politics. Now, overall, what did you think of the episode? Well, early on, I think it was we, we were pretty clear that what we saw on Monday night was not there was nothing unexpected on there that's pretty much what we expected um they didn't change any of my answers or anything else uh so i, I i'm not claiming that but it was as i think as you've said it's pretty clear i believe it was a very deliberate attempt probably motivated by especially from queensland the people in the labor party um but from both the major parties to encourage people or discourage people from voting for minor parties and try and pull them back to the major parties. This is much more than just about guns. They're very, very concerned that the last state election in Queensland, 31% of people did not vote for either of the major parties. And you've got a Victorian election about to happen. And there's a lot of dissatisfaction in Victoria with both parties. And interestingly, CIFA, the, the, the big bad guy on that, uh, on that Four Corners show has just started a great campaign in, in Victoria called Not Happy Dan, which is 
telling people to put labor last. And so they're effectively also encouraging people to at least consider the minor parties that many people are feel are more representative to community needs. Uh, that was a lot of the focus of the episode, uh, CIFA's activity in first the, the Queensland election. It claimed with the, it was called the Flickham campaign, Flick the major parties, yeah. that there was a misrepresentation that CIFA was campaigning on, on other issues unrelated to firearms when that was uh, their real agenda. Um, well, uh, they were campaigning and uh, Flickham was a campaign that was... And what they didn't say on that Four Corners clearly is there were many other groups also supporting it. CIFA was probably the, the largest, but there was the taxi councils and other, other people around the state who got on board because people are genuinely fed up with the major parties. And it's not just about firearms. And firearms aren't an isolated issue on their own, which that show presents. There's a lot of commonality of people feeling frustrated that their views aren't being heard. And they were just doing what you do in politics, which is tap in to the public mood. And I don't see that as um, anything other than politics as normal, to be honest. It seems like democracy to me that you can encourage people to vote either way. I mean, we ran our own ads and do our own things, and we certainly... Uh, were very open about ours was very firearm focused, but it was also about put the major parties last. We we ran a, I guess you'd say, parallel campaign with, whilst ours was totally firearms focused, it was also very much the exact same uh, result being encouraged, put the majors last. And another part of the episode talked about this uh, so-called secret Tasmanian deal, which uh, the, the shooting groups did with the Tasmanian Liberal Party in the lead up to, to the election, which was to relax some of the uh, restrictions on recreational shooting. And of course, uh, uh, they interviewed, he was, uh, I can't remember the exact name of the group, uh, Doctors Against Firearms, saying that if they were able to get their way in uh, Tasmania of all places, the, the rest of the country uh, would fall. Uh, was this a secret deal? What was the reality of this? The reality is several fold. Um, firstly, the medics against guns or whatever the group was actually called. Uh, when we did a little bit of investigation when I first came along, it's very interesting that everyone that we looked into who was a spokesperson is it cl tied extremely closely to either the Labor Party or the Greens in Tasmania, um, conveniently. But as far as, and then there were gentlemen was on from Gun Control Australia, and he was looking a bit uncomfortable at times. And I think that's because he wasn't quite telling the whole story. The whole story was that consultative, it was a normal consultative committee that government set up on a range of issues. And he did, did neglected somehow to mention that he had been invited onto that committee and that he had refused to go on that committee because he saw it, he said it was a conflict of interest. So, so he's invited onto a committee. He knows it's going on. Two years later, the night before the election, the secret is out. I guess he must have just forgot that he'd <laughs> been invited on all that time. <laughs> it's, it's really laughable that they pulled that out. But it goes further because... If you look at the changes they were suggesting, Tasmania, they were actually, regardless of the, the fear-mongering headlines, they were very mild and all but one or two of them are already in place in at least a couple of other states and have been for some time. You know, and they talked about it like it was the end of the universe. These extremists... And there really are left-wing left extremists, but they're just talking about uh, gun stuff in, in this case, that they're no more than people who would get up in a theatre and yell fire in a, in a, in a movie theatre. And when I was being interviewed for that Four Corners, the reporter, Sean Nichols, said to me, he said, don't the Australian communities have a right to be concerned. And my answer is, 
Of course. And it's only natural they would be concerned when someone yells fire. But once you look at the evidence, there's nothing to be concerned about. But if I'm sitting in a movie theater and someone screams fire, 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 of course I'm concerned. Now, later on, when I find there was no fire, I'm probably just irritated with the idiot that did it. And that's the situation that the gun control people have put themselves in because they scream like it's the end of the world every time. They're actually stopping any progressive reforms which would increase public safety. I mean, for goodness sake, when the NFA came in, the internet hadn't been invented. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff you could do. We certainly couldn't be having this uh, conversation online because there was no online. The world has moved on. And there's a lot of things you can do with, with new technology that would save governments a lot of money and be more effective in public safety. We can't simply cannot have that conversation because as soon as we do, we get that hysteria that you've seen unleashed from some of those people on, on Monday. Yeah, that's interesting to learn the, the full story of that. And what, what they also did in the episode was they, they made the link between what they called the watering down of, of firearms laws or another uh, expert they had on was uh, chipping away and they, they interviewed a police officer who dealt with uh, public shooting in Sydney uh, a decade ago and they uh, mentioned two cases of murder-suicide and then there was a, a woman murdered her uh, father and they, they blamed this on uh, lax gun laws, obviously trying to make the, uh, what they term the, the US connection, that if you have easily available firearms then you're going to have uh, more uh, more deadly uh, incidents with uh, firearms? Well, once again, there's more to the story. And the reality is that in Australia each year, more people die from falling than are shot, either accidentally or on purpose. Um, it's just extremely low numbers. And for them to... Ch there's always... People always... Since the beginning of time... I mean, even in the Bible, one of the first stories is about the brothers killing each other. You know, and they picked up the, a jawbone or something and killed each other. Human beings, unfortunately, uh, some, you know, are prone to violence. And they're going to be prone to violence, whether they've got a firearm, a knife, or a baseball bat, or a poison, or they do like the guy in Melbourne and drive people over with a car. Um, they cherry-picked a couple of incidents... Um, the one where the lady, uh, a terrible family situation where the sister killed the father, <sighs> there's more to that story because sadly, the sister had been under me uh, mental, you know, she'd had long-term mental problems and been treated. And she told other members of the family, not only that she had a grudge against the father and everything, but that she was going and, and doing this uh, shooting. I don't know, but if that was in my family, I think I would have uh, either contacted the club involved who would have instantly stopped the person being able to attend, or I would have contacted the local police. I mean, I think we it's easy to blame an implement, but if, if someone runs someone over with a car deliberately, we'd never say, oh, we should ban you know, Toyota Corollas because someone ran them over. I think it's a it's a very facetious argument. Obviously, we don't want uh, mentally unstable or criminals easily accessing firearms. Criminals actually do easily access firearms anyway. There's a massive black market in this country for firearms. Uh, it's thriving very well. And criminals are able to pretty much access whatever they want, whenever they want. And some of that is actually because we can never make some reforms that would allow law enforcement to focus their attention on criminal misuse because they're so busy spending 95% of all of the funding spent in this country on firearms management or regulation is spent on regulating farmers and target shooters. Now, if we look at the murder rates, using firearms, 95% of them, and between 90 and 95% of all the murders committed with firearms in this country are committed with 
unlicensed people, they've never had a firearm license, using illegal guns. And another law isn't going to stop that because those guns are smuggled in, they're illegally manufactured, there are all sorts of ways that, that people get them, just like, you know, people who don't seem to have any problem getting uh, illegal um, substances to get high. They don't, the same people will happily bring you firearms as well. So... Well, in London, where it has, they have strict uh, gun control in the United Kingdom, they've now got a stabbing epidemic and they're actually wanting to introduce knife control. Now, that, that argument is always put forward sarcastically. We need knife control and well, that's what they're doing. Uh, yeah, and that's it's a sort of nanny state mentality. And I know a lot of your audience probably doesn't own a firearm or is interested, but this is not about firearms. This is about... The, the, the state just wanting more and more control over people and trying to micromanage our lives in every way possible and tell us how to live and what we can do and what we can do. And realistically, if we want to have a free Australia, we need to stand up to all sorts of uh, stupid regulation. You know, there's, there's grounds for some regulation on some things, but this country's taking it to a whole new level. Now, also in the, the episode, they, they said that uh, Shooters Union, you're an affiliate of the, the National Rifle Association, which is the, the American, uh, the, the main firearms lobby group uh, there. Are you, do you have an official affiliation? What's, what's the arrangement? We certainly, certainly do. And I have discussed that with the reporter for a month in advance of the interview. And... Um, we have an affiliation every two years. I think we pay the NRA about uh, $300 every two or three years. And that affiliation allows our members to shoot their international shooting competitions. And what people don't realize is the NRA, aside from its political activities within the domestic United States, there's almost two NRAs. There's, there's, that political arm, and then there's the competition and training arm. And they're the la world's largest uh, group for um, uh, competitive international competitions. And so if you want to shoot any of those international competitions, you need to be affiliated. And we are, along with, by the way, most of the other shoot largest shooting groups in the country. Um, and they were essentially making out that that was a bad thing. I, I'm quite happy uh, that we're affiliated with them. We're affiliated with them because we want to be affiliated with them, but we're also affiliated because of that competitive side is, is the honest main reason. Um, but on the show, you know, they were equating us with that, which was I regard as a bit of a compliment in some ways because <laughs> <laughs> they're a highly effective lobby group. Um, they really are and love them or hate them. And, and even people that, that really dislike the NRA with, with a, a passion in po within politics study how well they work. And they work well because they're focused on grassroots politicking. It's not what the media says about big money. They actually spend very little money in election campaigns compared to other groups. They've got an army of people, five or six million members, who are out there knocking on doors, talking to local politicians, talking to people in community level about the reality of, of situations in their culture. And they do a great job in that. And, uh, you know, we can learn from them. What he didn't show was when he asked me something about where I said we could learn from them, he, they cut out the part where I said we also studied Get Up and, and think we learned a lot from Get Up, which <laughs> is on the opposite. And they cut that out of the answer. Oh, yeah, of course they did. <laughs> because we've actually spent more time probably studying Get Up. Um, and and uh, unfortunately, Get Up just stopped having me on their email list for some reason. <laughs> 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 but, uh, you know, they do a good job in their own way, you know, and uh, I don't like, agree with what they stand for, but I'll say this, they've been very successful. Uh, and so, yeah, we're, we're happily uh, affiliated with the NRA. We don't want the same things that they want in the United States. My goodness, anyone with any credibility would never suggest 
if you change laws here, it's going to be like America. It was never like America. And, you know, in that sense, the histories of the two countries are very clearly different. John Howard, uh, I wouldn't agree with him on a lot, but he, I agree with him on this. He has repeatedly said Australian gun laws would not work in the United States and because of two simple reasons. One is their Second Amendment to, the, to their Constitution, and the second reason is cultural and history. They're, they're just so different to ours. They've fought numbers of wars on their continent. I mean, the American Revolution, the first battle of the American Re Revolution was started literally because the British were starting to go house to house and, and collect firearms, and they said, no, you're not. And that was the first shots fired in the American Revolution. So it's, it's understandable from a cultural or historical view that Americans have a pretty aggressive stance on that. We don't here. Uh, we're probably a bit of a kinder, gentler uh, society in some ways. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, that you want to change something um, a little bit, that we want to be exactly the same as anyone else. I mean, to be honest, I believe that New Zealand and Canada would be far better models for us to follow culturally with firearms management and legislation. Uh, and, and they seem to have uh, pretty good rates uh, of uh, success, at least as good as here, without the dr dramatic and draconian discrimination. I mean, shooters really are almost the last group you can openly discriminate against and demonize without any fear of a uh sort of backlash now obviously the the campaign that you and the other firearms groups are engaged in is to try and influence a state and federal election we talked about the tasmanian and queensland election obviously there's the next up is the victorian state election in uh, a month's time and then there's going to be a federal election next year and a new south wales uh, state election and obviously you're focusing on uh, getting shooters to vote for friendly minor parties such as the, the shooters, fishers and farmers who've been able to gain a significant uh, following in, in New South Wales, even getting into the lower house. There's also uh, the Liberal Democrats, uh, One Nation, uh, CADA, uh, they're all considered friendly firearms parties. Uh, do you consider the, the major parties a, a lost cause? Because even well, some of their more conservative members, such as Tony Abbott, a couple of years back, he made a, a huge uh, song and dance about how the, the Adler shouldn't be imported yeah I'm sure he's a real expert on it I, I doubt he's ever even seen one let alone uh, understands that it's a, a 130 year old uh, mechanism um, that's been around forever but anyway that's a, that's another issue um, are the majors a lost cause it's a really really good question and it's actually something that our board and others have been looking at pretty closely with all these elections I would say that uh, if we look at the two majors uh, being, you know, the Liberal Nationals putting them together and the uh, Labor, Labor is a lost cause when it comes to firearms because they've had to cozy up so close to the Greens and the extreme Green point of view about firearms is basically ban them all. Um, and they'd even, you know, they'd probably disarm the military if, if you left them alone long enough. Uh, so they've had to cozy up to them to get a lot, you know, to get into power. So I think they're so wedded to that, it is a lost cause. And definitely you'd want to put them last in any election. The, the what we call in Queensland, the LNP, the Liberal National Party, and what in other states is, is a coalition of the Liberals and the Nationals. The Nationals themselves, aren't a lost cause, but if, if someone watching this is inclined uh, towards, you know, voting for them, they need to get in and really influence the local members and the policies of them. They know the policies aren't good, and many of them privately will openly admit it, but they will not stand up and say it because they're terrified of the mainstream media. You've only got to look at Monday night. That's why they won't come out. 
they know there's some real problems with the with the legislation they've got, but they're terrified to do anything because they know they'll be attacked. So within the national side of the, the, that coalition, I do think there's there's some good people. Um, uh, in Queensland, we had one uh, LNP member who crossed the floor to vote against uh, um, Labor Liberal uh, gun laws last year, and. Uh, he voted uh, for, at that point with, with Catters and One Nation and, and Independence. And uh, so there's some hope on that side, but the power brokers within there are city, inner city based. They don't understand this issue. They don't want to understand it. All they see is, oh my goodness, the doctor's wife at, at their local suburb might not vote for them. Well, it yeah. doesn't help that uh, the the main face of gun control in Australia is Tim Fisher, who was a former Nationals leader and Deputy Prime Minister. But uh, there, uh, you do have a significant ally in the current National Party room with Bridget McKenzie, who said that she wants to change uh, Australians' views on, on guns. Yeah. Senator McKenzie is a pretty fair-minded person. She, coming from a rural-type background, she understands... Uh, the, the firearm issue and everything else. This, within Australia, there's this huge divide between the inner city view where the only time they ever see a firearm is a, either on TV where a policeman or a criminal has one or in a video game or on the news, six o'clock news, when there's an, either an accident or something bad happens. And so they naturally don't, have a big understanding, but you get in the regional areas in this country, and, and as I have a cattle property, and I, if I went to tw the 20 closest properties, I guarantee I couldn't find one that didn't have a firearm. And yet, you don't see all this, you know, we're not all out puffing shots at, at each other. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And yet, it's there, and I think, yes, it does need to be turned around, um, the reality in Australia, there is well over 1 million licensed firearm owners and there's somewhere between 3 and 4 million registered firearms, which means that every weekend there's probably more people shooting as a recreational or occupational activity than there is playing golf in this country. It, you know, it's common, it's normal and everything else. It's only the mainstream media and, and certain political points of view that are trying to make it abnormal. And there's probably another two or three million unregistered firearms, and they don't seem to cause a lot of trouble, even though they're illegal. And there's ways you could make them all legal pretty quickly, but they don't, no one wants to know. Do you believe that public opinion is changing on, on firearms? Obviously, the, the mainstream media is, uh, as we've discussed, clearly against the firearms, uh, period. But do you believe, and obviously you're of the, I hope you don't mind me saying, older generation, is, uh, do you see um, many young, young people coming through who are excited about shooting? Um, hugely. Uh, we're seeing the, the between, say, uh, that rage range, probably mid 20s to mid 30s, is the fastest growing segment of our membership, and it's the fastest growing segment of a lot. There's a lot of them really like, uh, you know, getting outdoors, pest control, you know, recreational hunting, um, just target shooting, uh, different things. There's new competitions that are interesting and exciting. Um, and also just going out and you know shooting tin cans or something it's it's relaxing it's 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 there's a great discipline to it so yeah that side and and to be honest it's the younger ones who are really pushing back and so short answer yes there is a shift in public opinion and i think that shift is exactly why you saw that show on monday night they're worried you know the powers that be that want to keep us all fat, dumb and happy, so to speak, um, are a bit worried that the public's waking up that the major parties line on a lot of issues is not accurate. And this is just one of those issues. You think if you wake up to one issue that you find and you say, wait a minute, they've been telling me stories. All of a sudden your mind opens up, well, maybe some of these other things.
you know, I've never owned a gun, never want to own a gun, but maybe they're not telling the truth on that either. And maybe they're not. And, and that's the thing. I think that the, the public is widely opening up. Um, Bob Catter made an interesting comment on that show on Monday night. He said, if you walk down the main street of any town in Australia, everyone hates the two majors. And, and obviously you're, well, in the Queensland election, you were hoping for, for a hung parliament with uh, Catter and One Nation holding uh, the balance of power. We've, we've just discussed that it's very difficult to shift the, the major parties, but it would appear that the strategy is for, for these uh, pro-fire minor parties to hold the, the balance of power and be able to, to cut deals, to uh, relax uh, some of the, the regulations, given that we've just uh, gone through... Uh, the frustrations with the major parties is is that something that will work in in practice has it worked in new south wales where the the shooters have had the the balance of power in a couple of parliaments it hasn't worked to any huge extent it's worked in little ways and it has stopped the laws becoming even worse than we think they currently are so to that extent it's had some effect yes Queensland's a little different because you've got to remember we have no upper house. We're the only state in Australia that has no upper house. So we have no house of review. We effectively have an elected dictatorship for um, four years. The moment um, a lower house government is elected with its own majority because there's no house of review. So the only way you can get at some sort of review in Queensland is to have independents or minors in the middle and whether they're firearms friendly or not it's still a better case for democracy in this state that we have some sort of review rather than any one major party just pushing their agenda through and obviously as we discussed the the reason for the four corners program is because the the gun control advocates the media they're they're spooked that uh, uh you you and the the other firearm group making some some cut through and one of the uh proposals that they had was to uh ban donations from firearms groups they consider you uh, as evil as uh, t uh tobacco and and alcohol industry groups it's fascinating so one million adult Australians who have firearm licenses, which means we've been through more background checks than any politician in this country. We've been through mandatory safety training costing hundreds of dollars and all sorts of background checks and bought safes worth thousands of dollars. Those one million plus people, we have no democratic rights and we're not allowed to give money to cam or to campaign for people we want, but it's okay for the unions to do it with tens of millions of dollars each election. Um, I think it's undemocratic to isolate any one group and say they couldn't. The unions have got a right to do it. Well, so do we, so does um, the, anti the gun control people have got a right to give money to the candidates that they want. Well, it's, I, I just think it's atrocious. It's, it's exactly what the sort of thinking that Australians should be up in arms about of saying, hey, What's, what's wrong with this picture? You can't cherry pick groups. Oh, I don't like your group today. What if I said next week, oh, we shouldn't be able to, people from the unshackled, they're a bunch of, of loonies, you know, we shouldn't <laughs> let them have any airtime on the internet. There's some who'd agree well, with that. <laughs> there probably is. But if, if you want to live in a free society, you've got to accept that, you've got a right and I've got a right, even if those opinions are different, to push, you know, to, to encourage politicians to, to support us. And one million adult Australians is a pretty large voting block. And if, as they come together and get more and more politicized, in the state of play in politics in Australia, they start to become a, a bigger group. And I can tell you a lot of that one million people is not very happy with how they're being pushed around all the time. Yeah, if you're not, if you're worried about the the influence that one group uh, has, then uh, try and influence things your way. I mean, I hate this idea of banning anything. Period, because uh, it's something that you don't like. Yeah, it makes it it it's wrong in and of itself. If you're going to have a free society, why do you ban things unless there's a com 
there should be a really, really compelling reason to do something as drastic as banning pretty much anything. And we actually have things in place that laws have to be and regulations have to be addressed every 10 years to see that they're still relevant. Well, when it comes to this particular issue, they're certainly not. And I'd suggest they're probably not on a lot of other things either. They're just there because, oh, my goodness, we don't want to change them because we might get some blowback. You've got tiny groups like Gun Control Australia and Friends of Gun Safety and all these groups that pretend to be not wanting to ban everything, but they do uh, when it comes down to it. Um, they, they don't have enough members to fill a phone booth, most of them. They get a few people who've got a lot of money who donate a lot of money to them. The advocacy groups, be it sporting shooters with hundreds of thousands of members across the country or, or ourselves or other groups, we're just groups of people each putting in, you know, 20, 30, 40 to 50 dollars a year um, to try and protect our interests. It's a very different thing. If you, if you go to the grassroots, these advocacy groups are really, for the, for the, on the shooting side, are really very grassroots level, whereas the groups that are anti are very much in an elitist, tiny little group of people. They say they represent the community. Do they? Well, why isn't the community giving them millions of dollars? Why doesn't the community join their groups? Because... They're not really that relevant. They just like to yell fire in a movie theater. Analyzing it like that, it certainly puts a lot of it into perspective. Well, Graham, I've, uh, I'm glad that uh, I was able to give you this uh, right of reply on the show and have this uh, extended chat. Uh, all the best for, or you've got a busy time with, as I mentioned, three uh, elections coming up, which will keep you pretty busy. Uh, all the best and yeah, you're welcome back Thank on anytime. Appreciate all you do to keep the, the press a bit free. Ah, oh, thanks. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. The Victorian state election is being held on Saturday the 24th of November. I'm pleased to confirm the Unshackled will be having another election night live stream starting at 6pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time when the polls close. Join me on Facebook and YouTube Live along with my panel, which will be the Young Conservative, David Hiscock from XYZ and Magnus O'Mallon. If you want to take a stand against Antifa violence and intimidation, there is another free speech rally happening in Melbourne, hosted by the Australian Freedom of Speech Movement, which will be on Saturday the 1st of December at 12pm in the Melbourne CBD. Also, as always, remember we cannot do this without your support, and the best form of support is always becoming a patron of The Unshackled over at patreon.com slash The Unshackled, or like many of you have been doing recently, send us a direct contribution via our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash The Unshackled, which all goes a long way. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.